Hi, my name is Scott Vaughn. In this video, we'll look at solving Kepler's equation with Newton's method. Okay, so in this video, we'll start with an introduction. What is Kepler's equation and Newton's method? And the general topic will be the algorithm that we go through in calculating position over time in an elliptical orbit. So this is real life astronomy and rocket science. And the material that I'm presenting in this video is from the Kerbal Math and Physics Lab, chapter three, a workbook on, math and, uh, on rocket science and astronomy that I've written. And we'll go through example one, calculating position over time in elliptical orbits, and I'll use GeoGebra and Desmos to illustrate those calculations. Example two, we can use Kerbal Space Program to do the real rocket science and see an illustration of how that works and how it's uh, modeled perfectly in Kerbal Space Program. Then example three, we'll really do an example of solving Kepler's equation with Newton's method, kind of the center of what this video um, is as advertising. And then example four, one more example to compute the position of the Tesla Roadster that was launched by SpaceX in 2018. So to set this up, to lay some foundation here of what I'm talking about, Johannes Kepler was born in December of 1571, and lived to November 1630. And one of the things that he's famous for, among many other things, uh, in the context here, what's important are his uh, laws of planetary motion. Uh, number one, that orbits are elliptical. Number two, that equal areas are swept out in equal times uh, as a planet orbits through the ellipse. And number three, third law, the square of the orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of the ellipse. And Isaac Newton, born December 25th, 1642, lived to March 20, 1726. I put an asterisk here because uh, the date depends on which calendar uh, you're using. And by the way, I have another video here on YouTube where I go into the history of the calendar. So Isaac Newton came along after Kepler, and among many things that he's famous for, uh, he invented calculus, and he described the laws of motion in physics and gravity that proved Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So Newton basically invented calculus to explain these laws of planetary motion. So it's perfect to solve Kepler's equation with Newton's method. But uh, what equation are we talking about? And so when you look at those three laws of planetary motion, there are lots of equations that describe those laws. The f equation here describes the position of an object in an ellipse based on an angle and gives you the distance r. And this equation describes the relationship between the changing amounts of area and changing angle as a object or orbits around an ellipse. And this third equation describes the relationship between the period and the semi-major axis and the um, gravitational constant and the mass of the primary body. But it actually isn't any of these equations that I'm referring to. When I say Kepler's equation, I'm talking about this one. And I'm taking some time to distinguish here because even if you asked me a year ago, Kepler's equation, I really wouldn't have known what equation that referred to. So this was something that was pretty, uh, it's relatively new to me and really fascinating as I was working on this lab workbook, I came across this Kepler's equation uh, and it's central in the calculation of um, a position for an orbiting body in an elliptical orbit. This calculation, this equation is central to that calculation, locating objects in elliptical orbits uh, over time because they speed up and they slow down. It's pretty complicated and uh, part of that calculation, a central part of that calculation, is based on this equation. So these values of m, e, and this little e, these are, uh, this mean anomaly is an angle, eccentric anomaly is another angle, and e is an eccentricity. It measures how oval uh, the ellipse is. And I will go through all these terms in this video, explain this equation, explain the meanings of these uh, terms, um, and, uh, and, do, and do some examples. So just again, to continue to set this up, Kepler's equation is this equation that relates angles and position in an elliptical orbit over time. 
And Newton's method, when I'm talking about Newton's method, I'm talking about um, a numerical method of finding a solution to an equation that is typically done in a Calc 1 class. Um, it's maybe not uh, as emphasized as it once was because we can so immediately, quickly uh, solve equations with computers and calculators. We could do it instantly. But if you stop for a minute, think about how does the computer do it? Somebody has to program it into the computer. And particularly, an example exactly, this is perfect. Newton's method is perfect for something like this uh, because it's impossible to get an exact solution even on a computer. And so the solutions that we arrive at are what are called numerical solutions. They are with uh, any degree of accuracy you want. You can make it more and more accurate with more and more computer time and computer power. Um, but um, it's, an, it's a numerical method of finding a very accurate approximation to the solution. Um, and it's a, it's a perfect place to learn about that idea of a numerical method and it's a it's an application of uh, some calc 1 ideas uh, for example using a first derivative so that's what we'll do all right so central to this video I'll be solving Kepler's equation with Newton's method but this is pretty ambitious video I don't know how long it's gonna take I, I hope I can keep it concise and clear uh, so uh, settle in because uh, this there's a lot here um, because at the same time I want to actually use this um, to actually uh, calculate the position. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm going to apply Kepler's equation, explain how it works, uh, to actually locate uh, orbiting bodies uh, over time. And, and that's, that's the real-life astronomy and real-life rocket science that I'm also going to include in this video, not only just the pure math of doing the calculation, but what it really means. And so that is a uh, procedure that we'll go through. And so I'll, I'll try to give a kind of an overview of it here, and I'll go through this, of course, with examples. So uh, what we're really looking at is in the broad you know, picture, uh, we'll be given some average angular speed in an elliptical orbit with some semi-major axis A and some eccentricity E for this orbit. And will have some elapsed time, t, in measured in seconds. And from that, we will calculate this angle m that's called the mean anomaly based on that elapsed time. And once we've got that angle m, we'll, that's where Kepler's equation comes in, we'll solve for the angle e, what's called the eccentric anomaly. That's based on the mean anomaly. And then once we've got the angle E, step three, we'll calculate the angle theta, which is called the true anomaly, based on the eccentric anomaly. Right? And then once we have that, step four, finally, we calculate the position, R, the distance from the primary body to the orbiting body that's based on that angle theta, the true anomaly. And it's also based on the semi-major axis and the eccentricity. So the output would be location, the location of the orbiting body in terms of the distance r and the true anomaly theta, but it all was based on some elapsed time. Right? So knowing what the orbit is and given some elapsed time, we'll go through a series of steps calculating different angles uh, in order to actually locate it, uh, locate the, the, uh, the orbiting body as a function of time. That process is going to look like this, and it, it this diagram will help me kind of just sort of set up some of the uh, the definitions here, right? So, so I have an elliptical orbit here. I'm going to take an example with a rocket in an orbit about some planet, um, and so here, and so the planet is at one of the foci of the ellipse. So, the ellipse has a semi uh, has a major axis, which c contains two foci. The planet being at one, at the other focus, it's just empty space. Along that major axis, uh, we have the center of the ellipse, and um, at the ends of the major axis, we have an apoapsis. Apoapsis is the farthest distance in the orbit from the primary body. We have a periapsis at the other end of the major axis, and that point is a fixed point on the orbit that is the closest to the planet uh, as the uh, rocket orbits around. So uh, I have also drawn on top of it a circle that has a radius equal to the semi-major axis. The semi-major axis is the distance from the center of the ellipse to either periapsis or apoapsis. So there's a circle with a radius that's equal to the semi-major axis of the ellipse. That's also included in the picture. And so points are following 
uh, on the circle as the rocket follows the elliptical orbit. And, and this is how we're able to calculate its position over time. We need that circle because it represents an average speed, uh, and that is central to the calculation. Right? So uh, you can see these three angles that are going to be central to understanding how this works. We've got an eccentric anomaly, this darkly uh, striped uh, shaded angle in this example in the figure, that 59.67, that's the eccentric anomaly or centric anomaly uh, in this particular, at this particular point, uh, this particular, you know, instant. And the mean anomaly is another angle, uh, and it's also drawn from the center, and you can see in this example, in this figure, the mean anomaly is this 30 degree angle that locates this thing that's called the mean motion point. I'll get to that, of course, uh, as, as, as I explain the, the process. But, uh, and then there's a true anomaly, which is yet again another angle, and the true anomaly is an angle that's measured uh, from the planet. So actually all three angles are measured from periapsis, the mean anomaly to the mean motion point, the eccentric anomaly to this eccentric anomaly point, and the true anomaly uh, measured from periapsis, but actually from the planet uh, to the actual location. So, um, yeah, and also, what what's with the anomaly? Anomaly is a word that suggests something, you know, an error or something, a deviation, and, and that's where the term actually came from, is astronomers were first discovering the true nature of orbits. They recognized that they are not simple circles. And so the deviation from a circle became uh, referred to as an anomaly. So in this example, we have a rocket that's following an elliptical orbit. This is the example that I'll do as we get through this video. It's following an elliptical orbit with semi-major axis 25 and eccentricity 0.6. And we'll need all these values to locate the rocket over time. And in the process, we will um, find the value m first. Once we have m, we will solve for e, big E, the eccentric anomaly. Once we have um, e, then we plug it in this equation, find theta. So I'll talk about how that works. I'll do an example. But I thought maybe it helped to just put a few things on the screen there to sh give a, an image of the big of the big picture. So this is the Kerbal Math and Physics Lab that I'm writing, and this is Chapter Three, the Calc One. Uh, top, the, top, calc 1 topics in general, and the specific topic that I'm doing in this video is this uh, topic of solving Kepler's equation with Newton's method. And I want to just back up and say that Kepler's equation applies to the motion of any object in any elliptical orbit. For example, Earth or Mars in orbit around the Sun, or any moon orbiting a planet, or a rocket or satellite in orbit about any planet or moon. So this equation applies anywhere in the real universe, and it is modeled in the game Kerbal Space Program, which makes that game so interesting and fun as a learning tool, because it really does model the real rocket science and real astronomy that you would learn as a student and we can we can learn in in the game uh, those those concepts. So in this lab, we'll apply Kepler's equation to calculating the position of a rocket in an elliptical orbit as a function of time, and we'll use Kerbal Space Program to develop an understanding of Kepler's equation and its application by placing rockets and satellites in different orbits and computing their position as a function of time. And we'll check our answers in the game. So for circular orbits, finding position as a function of time is relatively simple. In a circular orbit, the orbiting body moves at a constant speed with a constant orbital radius, and therefore we can determine its position over time by multiplying the object's angular speed by the elapsed time. If we know an angular change in position and the radius of the orbit, we could locate the body at any point in time in that orbit. But if the orbit is elliptical, so that there are two foci, here's the planet, here's the second focus of the ellipse, I've got this point and the second focus that I can move around, so change this to a, an elliptical orbit. 
So this is, these are some nice points that I've chosen so that I have a semi-major axis of 25. That is, from the center here at minus 15 in the xy plane, from minus 15 to positive 10, that's the 25 unit semi-major axis in my example here. The eccentricity is this distance from minus 15 uh, to, to 0, the, the distance from the center of the ellipse to the focus of, um, to any either focus. So in this case it's a distance of 15 units. 15 units divided by 25 total, that's where the point 6 comes from. 15 divided by, tw by 25 is point 6. So that's the eccentricity. So now we have a rocket that's following an elliptical orbit, but there's also a circle that's superimposed here because we'll use that circle as a way of figuring out the position over time. Okay, so now I have the image with all of the angles and points visible at the moment. Um, so we can use this to check the calculations that we do. And you can see how all these things play uh, a role together. But I'm going to turn off these and show uh, what each of these parts are uh, one at a time. So in the elliptical orbit, we have a rocket orbiting around a planet. The planet is one of the f at one of the foci of the ellipse. We've got a point of periapsis, which is the point on the ellipse on the major axis closest to the planet. We have an apoapsis, which is the point farthest from the planet. Okay, so maybe the first thing to do would be to turn on the circle in the diagram. So we have a uh, ellipse with a radius of 25, a semi-major axis of 25. So what I'm doing here is creating a circle that has a radius of 25, right? Semi-major axis of the ellipse 25, now circle with a radius of 25 units that's centered at the same place as the center of the ellipse. So that's this equation here. When we do the calculation, this will make a little bit more sense, but just so you know where it is and how it plays or, uh, how it plays a role, there's this point, the mean motion point. It travels around the circle in the same amount of time as the rocket travels around its orbit. So it has the same average speed, uh, or yeah, same average speed and same average angular speed. So as the rocket travels around, this mean motion point is traversing the circle. And so we'll have this angle, m, and that's the mean anomaly. So, and, and you can actually see the true anomaly to the rocket is this 117.48. Well, the mean anomaly is a different angle from the center of the circle and the center of the ellipse that in this case is 45. And you can see how here the mean anomaly is 90 or about 90 and the true anomaly is 147.7 roughly. These both correspond at 180 together. And then 360 together and it starts over again. So mean anomaly and true anomaly right now are being uh, displayed. So let me add in the eccentric anomaly. Now the way the eccentric anomaly is calculated is by drawing a perpendicular line to the semi-major axis through the point where the orbiting body is on the ellipse. Right? So you can see this uh, vertical line here perpendicular to the semi-major axis. Where that line crosses the circle, that's a point that I'm calling the eccentric anomaly point. It's point K. And so as the rocket moves around, that perpendicular line follows the rocket. It's perpendicular to the, the uh, major axis. And where that line crosses the circle forms another sort of auxiliary point called the eccentric, that I call the eccentric anomaly point. And it's from that that I determine the eccentric anomaly angle. So here the eccentric anomaly angle is striped uh, and it's 67.41 and you can see how that's changing as the rocket goes through its orbit. So everybody coincides together at 180. And 360 and it starts over again. 
So these are all the angles and how they work together. Uh, and, uh, and of course, we'll do some calculations. We'll, uh, ultimately, we'll, the order in which we do the calculations is we, uh, we find the mean anomaly first. After that, we get the eccentric anomaly. And after that, we get the true anomaly. And that's how we can locate the position. The whole thing is based on this average speed. So the average speed leads us to the mean anomaly, which then gives us eccentric anomaly by Kepler's equation, which then we can solve by trigonometry uh, to get true anomaly. All right, let's take a look at our first example calculation. Consider a rocket in an elliptical orbit with semi-major axis A equal 25 units and eccentricity E equal 0 0.6, as shown in the figure below, figure 3 here. Suppose the rocket is traveling at an average angular speed of pi over 3600 radians per second. Calculate the position of the rocket 10 minutes after periapsis passage. So this, in this example, this is just a given value. We'll be able to calculate this as well, this average angular speed from other given uh, information. But here, keep it simple. Let's say this is um, obviously already given. And uh, the question asks for the position of the rocket 10 minutes after the periapsis passage. OK, so uh, that's actually um, that's the scenario here. So, so we will calculate the distance from the planet to the rocket and the rocket's true anomaly 10 minutes after it passes the point of periapsis. Uh, this paragraph is just saying that the, the following example illustrates the calculation of position at some elapsed time after periapsis passage, and this is because the periapsis is a convenient fixed point on any elliptical orbit. We could further generalize the following procedure to calculate positions with any elapsed time from any arbitrary initial point in the orbit. But to simplify in this lab, we'll just calculate from periapsis. So again, uh, we are given a rocket in elliptical orbit, semi-major axis 25, eccentricity 0.6, average angular speed in radians per second. We have as additional input a 10, minute, uh, 10 minutes of elapsed time, which is 600 seconds. And uh, step one is to calculate the mean anomaly. So um, we calculate that based on the elapsed time and the average angular speed. So we could call it the mean motion or the average angular speed. That's the pi over 3600 that was given. I'll call that n. And given an interval or a elapsed time of 600 seconds, the mean anomaly is just that uh, mean motion times the amount of time, the pi over 3600 radians per second multiplied by 600 seconds gives me a total angle of pi over 6 radians, which is the 30 degree mean anomaly. So it's in step two. Step two here where we calculate the angle E, the eccentric anomaly, based on the mean anomaly. And that's really the center of, of this video, is, is doing that calculation. And uh, it's something that we could do with Newton's method. Um, I, I realize maybe I haven't even said it yet, but I wasn't intending to go through a derivation of Kepler's equation. That can be found in other videos, and I'll put a link to at least one uh, in the in the description of this video, but uh, I'll just take that as a given equation and not try to derive it here. So we'll use this now with the given value that we just found of pi over 6 for m. We'll use the value that was given 0.6 for the eccentricity. And so we'll have this equation uh, here. So let's take a second to look at solving this particular equation. We have m equals e minus little e sine big E. We're solving for big E. So in this particular example, we have m is pi over 6, and the eccentricity little e is 0.6. And so to solve this, what I'll do is I'll move this term over to the left side, move this term to the left side, set it all equal to 0, and solve. We can solve this using a computer, a calculator, or Newton's method. Any method that we use provides an approximate solution. There isn't any way to get an exact analytic solution to this equation in general. The first thing I did was to type it in here where I'm using x instead of big E for the uh, variable in Desmos to look at where it's equal to 0, and I get 1.041. I could also check that on a calculator. So in the calculator, I'm typing in this equation, still using x for the variable. 
we need to be in radian mode because we have this angle in radians and uh, the value x has to be in radians as well. So make sure if you're on the calculator that you're in radian mode. Uh, let's think about the sort of window that would make sense here. Let's go from 0 to maybe 2. We sort of have to have some idea what this, this is the um, disadvantage of just going straight to the calculator. We wouldn't really know exactly what what the window to set, but since I already have it on the computer, I have an idea. So let's go 0 to 2 and on both the x and y scales. Change that y scale minus to minus 1 so we can see the axis. So it's crossing right here. Let's figure out what that value is. We're looking for a 0 for the equation. Left bound 1, that seems okay. Right bound, let's go to that should be good. 1.1. Guess. Somewhere right around there. Maybe there. 1.04149. So that's where I get the value. One, I'm going to round it off. 1.0415 is the angle in radians. 1.0415. That's where I'm getting that. Now, converting that to degrees, it's about 59.67 degrees. We can see that in the picture. I'm going to try to set the mean anomaly to about 30 degrees. So there it is. With mean anomaly of 30 degrees, with the same semi-major axis and eccentricity, we have uh, eccentric anomaly 59.68 in degrees. Well, I think naturally there's going to be a little variation here depending on where we round things off. So that's the 59.67 that I'm uh, indicating here. I think what's happening is we're just a little bit different in uh, GeoGebra because of the way in which it's, it's doing the calculation. It's rounding a little bit differently and it goes to 59.68. Uh, I think 59.67 is more accurate. So now that we have this angle for eccentric anomaly, E is 1.0415 radians, that's the 59.67 degrees. Using that angle, we'll calculate, in step 3, we'll calculate theta, the true anomaly, based on the eccentric anomaly, E. So E is 1.0415 radians, we're calculating true anomaly. Using this equation 1, refer to uh, back here. This one, again, I'm not going to do the derivation here. It's already uh, becoming a pretty long video. So this is a link where you can find uh, the, the derivation behind this that r relates these two angles. So this is the equation one that I use to find theta. So plugging in the value for little e is 0.6, eccentric anomaly 1.0415. Take tan inverse uh, to solve for theta. I get uh, theta over 2 is the tan inverse of this quantity. Multiply by 2. Uh, put that in the calculator and you get about 1.7076 radians, about 97.84 degrees, which again we can confirm with the, with the diagram. That's the angle 97.84 that I see here. That's the true anomaly. So we're really close to finishing this example. Once you have the true anomaly, you can calculate r, the distance from the primary to orbiting body. The primary body is the planet. The orbiting body, in this case, is the rocket. Based on that true anomaly, the semi-major axis A and the eccentricity E. So with true anomaly 97.84, eccentricity 0.6, semi-major axis 25, radial position is computed with, with this equation. This equation gives me the radial position in uh, polar form for a given uh, true anomaly. So I get a value r that represents the, the distance from the planet. So plugging in a is 25, e, little e, the eccentricity 0.6, uh, the angle 97.84. Here I can use degrees because this is just cosine of that angle. What, just make sure you're in the right mode. Uh, and so you get about 17.43 units, that's the distance. So um, that's really the final answer for this example, the location of the orbiting body in terms of the distance r and true anomaly theta. The rocket is a distance of 17.43 units from the planet at true anomaly of 97.84. And we could also confirm that in GeoGebra. What I want to do now is figure out the distance from the planet to the rocket, see what 
GeoGebra says. So measuring distance from planet to rocket, I get that distance from a, point A to point R is 17.43 units, whatever units you um, are using. In this case, it's just arbitrary units. All right, so that finishes that example. We've now finished example one. We got this answer, 17.43 units as the distance, and a true anomaly of 97.84. The calculation that we went through here uh, step by step was confirmed in the calculations in GeoGebra and with Desmos. So now let's look at example two. Here in example two, a rocket is in an elliptical orbit with about the planet Kerbin. Orbital semi-major axis is A equal 2160 kilometers with a given eccentricity of E equals 0 0.65. We're given the mass of the planet Kerbin is 5.29 times 10 to the 22 kilograms, and we're asked to calculate the position of the rocket 15 minutes after periapsis, after it passes the point of periapsis. So to solve this, we'll use Kepler's third law, which if you solve for T, you have t equals 2 times pi times the square root of a cubed over mu. t is the orbital period, a is the semi-major axis, and mu is this product, g, the gravitational parameter, uh, sorry, g, capital G, is the gravitational constant, m is the mass of the body that's being orbited, like in this, is this example, the planet Kerbin, the mass of planet Kerbin. And if you multiply those two together, this is called the gravitational parameter. So we can find the average angular speed by just taking two pi radians and dividing by the time that it takes to go around the orbit, the period, the orbital period, t. So that's radians per second. So to find the average angular speed, if we did 2 pi divided by t, that's 2 pi divided by this quantity here, and the 2 pi's would cancel. This fraction ends up being flipped. That's where we get this expression here. So n uh, equal to the square root of the gravitational parameter divided by the cube of the semi-major axis, that's the average angular speed, or the mean motion. So in this particular example, we use the universal gravitational constant g. That's, tr that's the value that's used in real astronomy and in Kerbal Space Program. And the mass of the planet, Kerbin, is 5.29 times 10 to the 22. So we multiply those two values together. We have the gravitational parameter for the planet Kerbin, 3.53 times 10 to the 12. And these values are assuming that distance is measured in meter, meters and time is measured in seconds. And so plugging the mu value and the semi-major axis. Mu is 3.53 times 10 to the 12. Semi-major axis was 2160 kilometers, which means 2,160,000 meters. And it's cubed in this formula. And so we have an average angular speed, or mean motion, 5.918 times 10 to the negative 4 radians per second. That is the average angular speed. If you imagine the rocket going around in a circle, that's how many radians it sweeps out per second in this very large circular orbit. But in fact, actually, it isn't going in a circle. It's going in an ellipse. But the circle represents the average angular speed. OK, so now we have the given input information, and we can calculate the position of this rocket as a function of time. So we had an elapsed time of 15 minutes. That's 900 seconds. So the mean anomaly, we multiply the average angular speed in radians per second times the number of seconds that pass. The average angular speed was 5.9184 times 10 to the minus 4 radians per second multiplied by 900 seconds. That's 0.5327 radians, which is about 30.5 degrees. In step two now, we're going to calculate the eccentric anomaly based on that mean anomaly. And so that's where Kepler's equation comes in into play. The mean anomaly we've now calculated is 0.5327 radians. We know the eccentricity is 0.65. That was a given. And so we're solving this equation, where m is 0.53 two seven looks like I missed the seven which would have rounded that up 
So let's solve this 0.5327 equal to e minus 0.65 sine e, and we're going to solve for e. Uh, let's see what we get. Okay, so to solve this equation on the calculator, let's move these terms over to the left-hand side to set it equal to zero to find that x-intercept. So I'll type that in. And then switch the sign minus, and I'm going to use x on the calculator for this variable. And then this will switch signs because I'm moving this term to the other side, so it'll be a plus. Now we have to be in radian mode here because we're involving both the sine of this angle and the angle itself, and of course I've got the um, mean anomaly in radians. So let's make sure we're in radian mode. Now this window should be fine. So I see the intersection here. Let's see if we can get a, a good decimal value for this, a good decimal approximation for this point. Second calc. We're looking for the zero, number two. A left bound. Yep, that looks like a left bound. A right bound. That looks like a right bound. This is setting boundaries for the calculator to now go through a numerical method to figure out what that point is, something that we can use Newton's method when I get to an example later to actually illustrate how this is done. So the guess is around there, and I get 1.1168. Yeah, so I'm actually rounding this wrong. It's more like 1.117 if I really rounded correctly. And now converting that to degrees, what we'll do is multiply that by 180 and divide by pi. So about 64 degrees. Now in step three, if I really have an eccentric anomaly of about 1.117 and an eccentricity of 0.65, we can calculate the true anomaly with this solving for theta. Uh, we get this equation and putting in a little bit more accurate value here. So I do still need to be in radian mode because this value here is in radians. Uh, and so it'll spit out an answer in radians as well. So that's 2 times tan inverse. If you're going to type in, well, that's easy enough to do mentally. Now I don't want to be in the square root anymore, so that looks good. So that ends the tan argument and then one more to and the inverse. 1.8712 if we round that a little bit more accurately. And then that value multiply by 180 and divide by pi to turn it into degrees so that we can more easily visualize. So about 107.2. That's still uh, rounded correctly. Okay, so that's the true anomaly, 107.2 degrees, and so now we can actually use that 107.2 degrees with the semi-major axis and the eccentricity in our uh, last step to actually calculate the radial position. So plugging in the semi-major axis, the eccentricity, the true anomaly, we get a radial position of 1,000 I'm sorry, 1,544,214 meters from the center of Kerbin. Uh, maybe I should put in a little extra comment here. That's not the altitude. And when you're in the game, the, the default is to display your altitude above the surface. So we'll look for an altitude of about 944,214 meters uh, at that instant in the game. Okay, so here we are in Kerbal Space Program. I'm launching a rocket here, the Kepler-1. The mission is an orbital test flight. Uh, we're going to confirm altitude, mean anomaly, eccentric anomaly, and true anomaly at t equal 15 minutes uh, in the mission elapsed time. So our target orbit is a semi-major axis of A equal 2160 kilometers and an eccentricity E equals 0 
I'm recording this video just after a Boeing launched that orbital test flight of the Starliner and they had a bit of an issue with their mission elapsed time in trying to intercept with the International Space Station and it's pretty neat because I, I realize how complicated that is. I had a bit of an issue with uh, calculating mission elapsed time in my work here. We can see in the Kerbal display the mission elapsed time, MET, since the liftoff. We can also see the semi-major axis of the orbit, the eccentricity, also mean anomaly, eccentric anomaly, and true anomaly, the orbital period, and many other things on the right side of the screen. These angles are displayed on the right side using the Kerbal Engineer. That's a free downloadable add-on to the game, what's called a mod. We can see our altitude at the top of the screen and also at the bottom of that Kerbal Engineer display. So now, as we approach periapsis, the point of closest approach to Kerbin, we'll look at the mission elapsed time at the point of periapsis so we can measure forward 15 minutes after periapsis passage. The periapsis occurs at mission elapsed time 2 hours, 59 minutes, 57 seconds. Unfortunately, it's slightly complicated that periapsis occurs exactly 3 seconds before the 3 hour mark. Anyway, we'll now need to wait 15 minutes after periapsis to confirm our calculations. Okay, and over here in the flight engineer, we can confirm that the eccentricity is what we want, 0.65. Uh, this is a zero degree inclination. Uh, you could check that the orbital period, I did, that's the correct orbital period based on the semi-major axis that we have. Uh, semi-major axis being 2160 kilometers, or 2,160,000 meters. You can see really right now at periapsis we basically have all of these angles essentially zero. So what I'm going to do now is wait 15 minutes after periapsis passage which means a time a mission elapsed time of 3 hours 14 minutes and 57 seconds. So I want to fast forward to about 3 hours, 14 minutes, 57 seconds, so that's 15 minutes after periapsis. So we're waiting for 3 hours, 14 minutes, 57 seconds. Right now I have 3 hours, 13 minutes, 30 seconds. I'm watching the mean anomaly to reach 30.5 degrees. Right now, mean anomaly looks like 27, almost 28 degrees. Okay, so that's it. We've confirmed our calculations in Kerbal Space Program. Kerbal Space Program accurately models real-life rocket science. We can see the calculations are just as we expected right here in Kerbal Space Program. Pretty neat. Okay, that's the end of uh, example two, uh, but uh, this is just beautiful here. Uh, I'd like to see, uh, you know, successful missions got a return for a splashdown. Let's, let's make sure that that happens. Okay, and there they are. Looks like they made it, or uh, Jeb made it. I guess it was just Jeb in this on this mission. So, success. Splashdown. Very good. Okay, so that's it. We're done example two. Let's move on to example three. Now, actually, I really finally actually use Newton's method here. Example three. We solve Kepler's equation, m equals 
big E minus little e sine big E using Newton's method, and we check the result with the computer. Suppose we're given values m, the mean anomaly, equal pi over 6, that's got to be an angle in radians, and the eccentricity of the orbit 0.5. So we have this equation, m equals big E minus eccentricity sine big E, and we'll first rewrite the equation in this form. Move everything to the left-hand side in this equation, so big E becomes negative, this 0.5 sine E becomes a positive. We're looking for an x-intercept for this equation. Really, part of what the lesson here really is about is this is not an equation where you can just immediately, algebraically, exactly solve for E. It's not like you can factor out E. There's no algebraic, in fact, generally there's no analytic way to solve for E to get an exact value. So we need some numerical method. We could use the computer, we could use a calculator, and both of those are doing the calculation numerically, giving us a very accurate decimal approximation, and Newton's method is perfect for that. It's perfect for this type of equation where we couldn't get an exact answer no matter how we do it, no matter whether we're using a computer or a calculator, it can't be found exactly. Okay, just a quick overview of how Newton's method works. Um, you can Google and uh, YouTube uh, and find lots of videos where people go through this with many examples and, and more in depth. This is actually taken from Paul's online notes, so that would be a perfect example uh, website to go to, to to learn more about Newton's method. But basically the idea is you've got some curve, y equal f of x, that's the red curve in this diagram, and what we're trying to do is figure out where it crosses the axis. So we're looking for an x-intercept, a solution when the curve is set equal to zero. So we don't really know where it crosses exactly, so we make some initial guess. We we'll call that x0. At x0, we can calculate the tangent line. The tangent line is a basic tool from Calc 1. The tangent line is this blue line, and it uses the derivative. That's what the f prime represents. Uh, it represents the derivative, and at zero, oh, x, at, sorry, at x0, the derivative tells me the slope of the tan, uh, the slope of the tangent at that point. So, this is the equation of the tangent line. And if you want to know where the tangent line crosses, you set the tangent line y equal to 0 and solve for the x value, which we'll now call x1. Solving for x1, well, you could subtract this term to the other side, divide by the derivative, and then add the x0 over. So x1 is the x-intercept of the tangent line and it's right there in the picture. And then, of course, that's a better approximation for the actual solution we're looking for. So we could then use that x1 to repeat the process to get x2. So at x1, we calculate the slope of the tangent. We find the, intercept, the intersection of the tangent line with the x-axis. That's the point x2. So just x2 is calculated based on x1. And you could just continue iterating that process. And so Generally, Newton's method begins with some initial constant value that was an initial guess, and each successive approximation to the solution is based on a previous value minus whatever function you were trying to solve equal to zero divided by its derivative. So that's the general process of Newton's method. Let's go back to that particular example. So now, following Newton's method, we'll let f of x be pi over 6 minus x plus 0.5 sine x. I'm using x instead of the eccentric anomaly, capital E. And so taking a derivative with respect to x, the derivative of this constant is 0. The derivative of this term minus x, that's minus 1. Then I have a constant factor 0.5 times the derivative of sine, that's cosine. We can, in all of these applications, in solving Kepler's equation, we could take our first guess to be the mean anomaly. So if I take x0 equal to m, which is this given pi over 6 value, we'll just iterate this formula now to find each of the successive approximations x sub n plus 1 based on the previous x sub n. So if the first value was x0, then our next 
approximation is x1, we'll use this function f here, where we plug in the previous estimate, and we'll plug, in, plug that into the derivative, and each time evaluate, and that gives us our next value, which we can then iterate, and doing that, after four iterations, the values for these x sub n plus ones are going to approach approximately 0.922. We could confirm that graphically on the computer or on a calculator. I have that in Desmos here. 0.922 is the point where this function crosses. And this is a table of the values in Newton's method, which I can show I got from Excel. So this is Kepler's equation in general, and I, in this particular example, I'm using pi over 6 as my initial guess. Pi over 6 is about 0.5236, or 0.5235999. The eccentricity that we were given is 0.5, and so I'll take x0 to be that initial guess. So then when I run through Newton's method here, my first guess is that x0 value. You can see that right there. Now to do Newt's method, I have to get f at value x equal to uh, the fixed mean anomaly minus the current x value plus e eccentricity times sine of x. And then also use the derivative minus 1 plus e cosine of x. I'm getting that from here, right? This is the f, that's m minus x plus eccentricity sine x, and here's the derivative minus 1 plus eccentricity times cosine of x, that goes on the bottom. So the first guess is that value right there in cell b5. And then this is just computing based on the values that were given, both of these, and then the next estimate is the value in cell C8 minus the values in D8 divided by E8, and that gives me this value. And then the next estimate is based on the values in C, uh, C9, the previous estimate, minus the value in D9 divided by E9, right? that's this value, C9 minus D9 divided by E9, and it just continues to, to iterate, uh, basically recursively calculating better and better approximations, but it settles to really 0.922 uh, pretty quickly. So that's what we can see graphically happening in Desmos. So what we just did there was solving Kepler's equation with a value mean anomaly pi over 6 and eccentricity 0.5, we found the eccentric anomaly 0.922 in radians, the eccentric anomaly at that particular mean anomaly with that particular eccentricity. Okay, so now one last example. In February 2018, SpaceX launched a red Tesla Roadster into an orbit around the Sun which passes far enough from the Sun to cross over the orbit of Mars. The Tesla Roadster, with a mannequin named Starman in the driver's seat, orbits about the Sun with a semi-major axis of approximately 1.325 AU, those are astronomical units, with an eccentricity of 0 0.256. So one astronomical unit is about 149.6 .6 million kilometers. So the data below is from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and it's used on these two websites, which are really neat websites that track the position of the Starman and the Roadster. Below is the Roadster's position data for June 24th, 2018. So this is, these are a set of examples now from uh, Chapter 3 in my Kerbal Math and Physics lab. And I think that I will leave this as an exercise for the viewer to go through all of these, but I'll just sort of give a little bit of a, of a hint as to, as to what's here. And I've got these answers posted with these questions uh, on... Uh, I'll provide a link to this document uh, in the description so you can try these calculations for yourself. So we are given the Julian date for this particular tracking data, the actual calendar date, June 24th, 2018. We've got the semi-major axis in astronomical units, the eccentricity of the orbit, 
we're given on that particular date that the mean anomaly was about 90.46 degrees and the true anomaly 118.5. And actually what we can do is to go through and calculate with that particular mean anomaly, we can calculate eccentric anomaly, which we can then use to calculate this true anomaly. But to go through these questions, we'll figure out um, the period of the uh, roadster's orbit and its angular speed. Then we'll take that given mean anomaly uh, and figure out how long that's been since the periapsis. We'll use the mean anomaly and the eccentricity to calculate the true anomaly by getting eccentric anomaly and solving Kepler's equation, etc. And then we'll plot the orbit. This is a file that has uh, answers to this Kerbal Math and Physics Lab, and there's chapters here on algebra, pre-calculus, trigonometry, Calc 1, 2, and 3, and differential equations. So if I jump to the Calc 1 chapter, these are some other examples where you can check the work, uh, check your work, uh, see if you get these answers for solving Kepler's equation. What we're looking at is question number seven. So converting the semi-major axis to meters, um, I can calculate the period for the Tesla Roadster as about one and a half years. It takes about one and a half years for the Tesla Roadster to complete one orbit around the sun. Its a average angular speed is about 1.3 times 10 to the negative 7 radians per second. And with the given mean anomaly of 90.4 degrees, we can calculate that it would take about, uh, that, that is about four months since the periapsis. Uh, it was launched in February, and so in June, that's about a period of about four months. With the given mean anomaly of about 90 degrees, 1.57 radians. We can solve for the eccentric anomaly um, by a numerical method or using the computer. We get an eccentric anomaly of about 1.8, which then I can solve for theta, get about 118.5 degrees. And then I can plot that. I could use the semi-major axis in the eccentricity and the angle, the true anomaly, and radians to locate the position, the radial distance, and then plot that position. So I plotted that uh, in Desmos, the orbit of the Earth and the orbit of Mars and the orbit of the Roadster, and then the location of the Roadster at that particular moment when it's Basically, it's the location of the roadster relative to the periapsis, where periapsis has been located right on the x-axis, on the positive x-axis in this coordinate system. All right, so using a true anomaly of 2.086 radians and a semi-major axis 198.22 million meters, I can compute the radial position as 211 million meters. That's the r distance from the sun to the roadster. So below Mars orbit, it's in red, it's approximated by a circle with a radius of 228 million meters, and Earth's orbit is approximated by a circle with a radius of 149.6 million meters, and the roadster's orbit is traced out in purple in this uh, diagram with this uh, polar uh, function for the, uh, for the ellipse, where I have the semi-major axis of the orbit and the eccentricity, and I just use theta running from 0 to 2 pi to plot out that orbit of the roadster. And then to locate the roadster at that particular instant, I use the true anomaly, which true anomaly of 118.5 degrees translated to about this 2.0686, that's the true anomaly, 2.0686. And so I can find rectangular coordinates, uh, the r, the radius, times the cosine of the angle. That's the x value for the rectangular coordinates for the location of the roadster. And this is the y value, r sine theta, at 185.4 million meters. So I've plotted the roadster according to the radial distance and the true anomaly. That's its location at that particular date where periapsis is on the positive x-axis. All right, so that's the end of this video. That's the end of this example and this video. I hope it's been interesting and, and useful.
And thank you very much for watching, and be sure to like and comment and share and, and check out some of the other videos I've made for the Kerbal Math and Physics Lab.